Well, I don't want to get part of it today. Um, Ms. Ms. Francis looked at Kathy and said, let me tell you something, you do not work for the church. She said, every time Harold would get to a new church, he would have the SPR chair stand up. He said, does my wife work for the church? He said, no, sir. And he said, y'all all remember that. <laughs> Harold was a dynamic preacher. And he was also preaching on this, and then on another time when I heard him preach, it was around Christmas time, and he talked about the finger of God reaching down and touching the earth. The essence of God. The real thing. Now, this scripture goes on to say, and so did the psalm that we read, that God has given us dominion over everything. The problem is, that we're a lot like what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 13. We see in a mirror dimly. We don't really understand the power that God gives us to have dominion over the world. Now, in part, because we're people and we have to grow in intelligence and closeness to God. For example, when I was a kid, we changed the oil in the car. We went and took the oil and poured it down the fence line. It made a good edge keep the grass off the fence. I'm seeing some heads shake. A few people have done that. We don't do that anymore. Or well, we shouldn't be doing it anymore. And the reason we don't do that anymore is because we found out that that filters down through the ground and it gets into the water table. It ends up in our drinking water. And we don't put our extra prescription drugs down the toilet anymore, right? Because we found out that it gets into the water supply. Well, we, we didn't know that before. We learned the hard way. And so there are many things we're still learning about what it means to have dominion over this earth. But it's clear to me from this passage of Scripture that God gave us the job and we haven't done very well with the job. I can just imagine what God thinks about all that smut we put up into the air. And all of the things that we do that throw into the trash dumps. Can you imagine? I, and look, this is an aside. If anybody ever wants to volunteer to come wash cups every Monday, we'll go to using ceramic cups for coffee. I can imagine that somebody in the year 2928, if we're still living then, is going to look at all these styrofoam cups that are in the trash dump and say, what are they did with those? We, we tried to do spaghetti. We really tried very hard to do biodegradable plates. They didn't work. They got soggy. But, but we're not taking as good a care of this planet as God has given us the job. Way back when, when Adam was around, God said, you name everything. You get it started. You take care. Remember that in the Bible where he's beginning to name things? And he was exuberant at the beginning. We had really great names like elephant, rhinoceros. After a few days, he must have got really tired. Then we got names like cow and dog and cat. <laughs> But he named them all. And we were supposed to take care of all of these things. We're supposed to care about animals. We're, we're doing a great job, I think, nowadays of looking after animals as far as I, I see on the Facebook or the Internet all the time where dogs are being fostered places and they're being taken care of and we're trying to find homes for them. We're not just letting them wander the roads and, and stuff like we used to. But what are we doing about everything else? You know, last week we kind of talked about the kind of smut that gets into our lives from what we watch and what we do on TV. But this week we're much more concerned with the kind of smut that's in our lives from the outside. And if God told us we were supposed to manage it, what have we been doing? Now, I know we can't fix it all right here. But recycling is one way we can do it. Being aware of the consequences of the things that we use is one way we can do it. Understanding that God's creation is for the whole thing to be saved. That Jesus didn't come just to save a few. He came to save everybody. And we were then given the power to control or, or manage or to take care of the world. I love this part of this passage where it says that the the sanctifier and the sanctified 
Our brothers are okay with calling each other brother. I, I wonder what God really thinks about all of these Christians out there that, you know, we have a cafeteria plan of Christianity today. You could be Methodist or Episcopalian or Lutheran or Presbyterian, whatever you want to be. And we're all on the same team, right? Or we're supposed to be on the same team. And I just wonder what God thinks about when we get into competitions to see who can be better than the other. I know that there are some churches that do certain things better than other churches. And, and you know, if you're a person that uh, wants to sing in a choir, uh, we, we need you to sing in the congregation here. We don't have a choir, but there are choirs around. And if you ever have that the desire, you say, I can't be moved spiritually if I'm not singing in a choir. I can give you some references. There's lots of churches that need people in the choir. You know, if, if, it's just always been one of the things. Jim Killen was my pastor in Deer Park for, I guess, five or six years. I was a chairman of evangelism there. And uh, so every, every Sunday, we had little cards. This is way before COVID. We had little cards that people filled out if they were visitors. And then on Tuesday, I would go down to church, and he would give me this stack of cards, and I would drive around and go see all the people that visited. And it wasn't just me. We had two or three of us. And, and we called it apple pie ministry because we would go visit and we'd go back to the church and eat apple pie. <laughs> um, but I went to people all the time, you know, and they'd say, well, we really enjoyed church today. But, you know, we're new to Deer Park and we saw where you were and we came. And, but we're really, you know, we, we, we're really Nazarenes or we're Assemblies of God or whatever. And, of course, here I am. I I've had a sales background. I'm trying to tell, well, you'll be okay at our church. Come on anyway. And boy, Dr. Killen got all over me. He said, no, they won't. He said, you, your job as an evangelism person is to help them get plugged in where their spiritual needs get met. It's not about us. But Jim also told me one time, he said he, he had a church that, that was not very evangelistic. Okay. You've heard me call us the frozen chosen, right? And we're not always real. We're friendly, but we're not always outgoing in this Methodist. And uh, so he had this church. It was over on the other side of town. I won't name it. And he was the pastor. And so they met. And they had a town hall meeting. And they all got together and they said, we need to become evangelistic. We need to reach out into the community and become evangelistic. That was, that was a devote to, the, to become evangelistic. That's not a vote a church should ever have to make. But here's the funny thing. The next Sunday they had a whole bunch of people show up. They hadn't even had a chance to go be evangelistic yet. They just changed their attitude. And so I think sometimes we're dealing with, with this, this stuff. Oh, preacher, you tell us we need to be concerned with what we watch on TV. You need to tell us we need to be concerned about recycling. It's just too much. The reason is we're looking for the wrong places for the right answers. We're not going to get an answer from the mayor or the governor or the president about how to control the world. We're going to get an answer from Jesus Christ. It was a big thing for a long time to say, what would Jesus do? Y'all remember that? It was a big movement. I think, I think I, I don't like it in the sense that it makes Jesus past tense. See, I, I would much more rather us adopt the saying, what is Jesus doing? right now because I don't think he's quit the job do you? No. I think he's still at work sanctifying and saving Amen. and I think sometimes we need to remember that we are being sanctified we haven't reached that place yet I guess if you were here last week you know my friend Chuck King he's a pastor in Seabrook I saw him on Monday and he announced to me that he cancelled his cable because of my sermon last week now, I don't put too big of a halo on Chuck because he called me on Tuesday and said, can I come to your house and watch TV? <laughs> he was being facetious. And sometimes I am not expecting you to go do that. I would rather you have an awareness of what we're supporting and we're not supporting. I want to tell you, we have tremendous power as Christians. And surely we could contact the cable companies, but you know, they're just trying to make a living. 
What we ought to do is go to the advertisers that are advertising the stuff we don't agree with and do something about it. I don't know how many letters it would take, but I guarantee you when they start to see the threat of their bottom line changing because we Christians decided we're not going to buy their product anymore, sometimes it works. It won't work if you don't try it. I would actually think that that letter, that communication is probably more important than sending one to your congressman. Because there's really never been in history a top-down change in the culture. It usually is a grassroots movement that changes the culture. So if there are things that are detrimental, what do we do about it? Do we just notice it and move on, or do we get passionate about it? Will Willimon was the bishop in Georgia for a while, or Alabama, somewhere in the south. And uh, he told a story about this friend of his who was a preacher, called him up and said, Will, he said, uh, man, I am upset. People in my church, man, they are passionate about all kind of the wrong things. He said, they're like the car directors having an affair with organist. There's just passion going all around. And Will said, well, would you send them to my church because we could use some passion about anything. <laughs> I think really we're kind of there. We need to be passionate about who we are as Christians, what it means to be a Christian. I know there's stuff out there we don't agree with and we don't like, but then I read this passage where it says, wait a minute, if, if, if they're believers, I'm supposed to be calling a brother. Now, I raised two sons. Now, they're brothers. They're full, 100% brothers. And they don't always agree on stuff. Sometimes they make fun of each other. Sometimes they pick on each other. Well, boy, let somebody from the outside pick on either one of them, and you got a war on your hands. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, friends. we got brothers and sisters down at the Baptist Church, the Episcopal Church, the Catholic Church. Do we think do we stand up for them? Do we look after them like their family? And they may you may think, well, they're not looking after us like we're family. Well, sometimes you've got to be the one to start. We have a responsibility, I think, to think back about this when we see Jesus. Where do you see Jesus? I'm pretty sure you don't see him up here. Where do you see him? Do you see him in the love you have for your children? Do you see him in your dog? Certainly you can see love in dogs. Do you see him in the friends that you have, the community that we live in? One of my preacher friends is retired. And he uh, published an article last week that somebody else had written. And it was about this, this tendency we have to have a personal Savior. Y'all ever heard that? Jesus is your personal Savior. And in this article, it equated personal and private as being the same. See, I think they're very different. And he and I had some discussion about that. I, there's no argument that Jesus is your personal Savior and your relationship with Jesus Christ is yours, not anybody else's. But any notion that you have a private Jesus that's only yours misses the point of the community put in place by Jesus Christ. <laughs> Any notion that He's your Savior, He is the Savior of the world and you have a personal relationship with Him and He has a personal relationship with you, but He's not to be kept in a box. And we need to understand the real power that this Jesus Christ, the essence of God, the real thing, has to change the world. Now, all of us have some stuff in the world we'd like to see change right now, don't we? There's some stuff going on you wish would change, right? Yep. Amen? Can, Amen. Can, Amen. Can, Amen. All right. So, where are you looking for the change? Because I want to tell you where it's going to start is right here. And it's going to start with your relationship with Jesus Christ and beginning to have the eyes of Christ, the heart of Christ, the hands and feet of Christ. 
Because that's going to be the only solution that brings into fruition the scripture that says every knee shall bow and every lip shall confess our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen because of the civil authority or the political structure of our country or any other country. What happens in the kingdom has no country boundaries. It has no culture boundaries. It has no racial boundaries. The kingdom is forever. The kingdom is bigger than we are. The kingdom is a place where God's power is realized and brought to fruition. Now I want to spend more time in the kingdom. How about you? I want to spend more time believing that God can fix it, more time turning it over to God, more time relating through God, and less time thinking that I've got all the answers. Which, by the way, I don't. Just in case you were wondering. I'd like to try. Some days I think I can do it. Our humanness gets in the way of understanding the size, the power, and the magnitude of what it means when he says that Jesus was put on this earth a little lower than the angels for us. And now Jesus is glorified at the right hand of the Father. And he left us to do his work. To manage the planet. To manage our resources. To care for each other. And to live in community. The community is supposed to encourage. And also, the community should hold us accountable. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I don't like that accountability part sometimes. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. But you know, when somebody comes to you because they love you and they care about you and they give you some corrective ideas, usually you should pay attention. If one person saw it, probably ten did. <laughs> Sometimes it takes real guts to love somebody enough to tell them. And the Bible tells us how to do that, right? You go to them personally to talk to them. If that doesn't work out, you take two or three people. I mean, there's a recipe. But there's a difference in doing that with the loving notion that they are your sister or your brother in the faith. Not that you're better than them or they're better than you. Even in the hierarchy we have in the church, Vincent Harris, he's back from his sabbatical. He's a district superintendent. But he's an elder just like me. The bishop, Bishop Jones, he's, he's been assigned to be the supervisor, but he's an elder just like me. He's not better than me. He might be smarter than me. He certainly is taller than me. <laughs> and all of us are on the same playing field because, you know what, we got baptized in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's where the power to do ministry is. But you have to remember you're baptized in the name of the one who sanctifies Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And any power we have to change the world is going to come from there. So it's kind of like uh, a spotlight, you know? They shine a spotlight down on the performer and you can see the performer better, you know, on the stage. Well, that light is being shined. That light comes loud and clear from Jesus Christ. And friends, we need to step into the light. Yes, our actions will be more visible. And yes, other people will be able to see that we're the people that God created us to be. To be the hands and feet of Jesus. To do the work He called us to do. To bring about the community that he came to create. He came to create community, not the Christian church. And we need to live into that community in fullness. I, I, I think all the time what, what, how meaningful it is to me to have community. Take advantage of the community. If you need to be prayed for, say it. If you need a hug, say it. If you need help, ask for it. 
That's what the community is supposed to do. And it shouldn't matter if they're a member of this church or a different church. It shouldn't matter if they ever go to church. It's not for us to decide where they are in that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's their decision. But our task is to love them no matter what. Now, that's some hard assignments. But I believe that Jesus really lived on this planet. Don't you? Yep. Amen. I believe he really walked around. And he said stuff and they wrote it down with red letters in some of the Bibles. And I believe the political structure of the time, which included both the civil authority and the church authority, were scared to death that he would turn the whole thing topsy-turvy. And they tried to shut him down. They killed him. He suffered death so that God could understand well, how we suffer with death. And then three days later, they didn't understand it. He tried to explain it to the, the disciples. They didn't understand it. He said, that temple over there, that beautiful building, they say is so beautiful that it's unbelievable that it was even made with human hands. That thing, he said, it's going to be destroyed. The disciples couldn't get it. Do we really believe in the restoration of the kingdom from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns eternally in the heavens? Sometimes I know that we say we believe it and we don't live it out. I know that's true because the Bible says if we had the faith the size of a mustard seed, we could move mountains. That tells me we can change anything. If I can move a mountain, I, I can move a house. A house is a lot smaller than a mountain. And the disciples went to Jesus and they said, Jesus, how do we get more faith? He said, you don't need more faith. You need any. If you just had as much as a mustard seed, you could change the world. So maybe the reason we haven't fully embraced the job God gave us to do to have dominion over the earth is because of our own lack of faith. You don't need to get more. You just need to use what you have. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, as you're able, would you please stand? Take this opportunity to offer signs of reconciliation and peace to others in the building. <laughs> peace.
Today is a Worldwide Communion Sunday. And so people in churches all over the world, on whatever their Sunday is, some of them started Sunday yesterday, I'm sure, will be having communion. Uh, you know, that means a lot to me when I think about it because my understanding of communion is that time when we go to God's table, to that place where all of the saints that have already gone on to be with God are. Amen. All of them. It's a big day. And so when we come up here, you know, to, to get communion, we don't come up here just to get some little piece of bread and grape juice. We come up here to celebrate at God's table for all of those who have died in Christ up till now. And it's that time when the, the community of saints crosses the border between earthly and heavenly. Which is why you'll often hear me say, come to the place where heaven and earth meet. So today we'll be doing that with people all over the world. And uh, that's always exciting to me. It always concerns me a little bit when people go to the ball game and they have tears in their eyes for the national anthem, but they come to the communion table and they just think it's a snack. Uh, this, is, this is, to me, this is the most holy time ever. And so we, you know, as, as one of my friends was talking the other day, there's some churches where attendance is down on communion Sunday. It doesn't make any sense. Wesley said, you should have communion as often as you can. He personally took communion three times a week. And so we want to have communion as often as we can. Um, we do it every Saturday night here, uh, the Saturday night service, and then on the first Sunday of the month, on the weekend. Uh. Okay. The table is almost ready. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Almighty God, you are the creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today, his family in all the world is joining at his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with your church throughout the world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And the church said, 
Amen. So if you have some spare change to put in the bucket, that goes for World Communion Sunday. Our offering remains in the back in the basket. Friends, the table is prepared. Come to this place where heaven and earth meet.
has everybody been fed? I have to ask because I forgot Ann last month. Anytime y'all see that, raise your hand and say, I get busy thinking sometimes. Thinking is a dangerous thing. Friends, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. We've been to God's table. Our experience is an experience not to be compared with anything else as we relate to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hopefully we've been inspired to go from this place a little bit differently than we came. And so as we stand now to sing, we sing, we've a story to tell to the nations as our closing. Mm -hmm. century, Ignatius of Loyola said this, Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward except that of knowing that we do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.